And this is another man that does not need an introduction. I know you have changed my life and you've changed, I think, everybody's life in here because of the many battles that you have fought for us, the countless tireless hours that you have spent writing, the amazing vision that you had so many years ago, even coining the term whole food plant-based. So Dr. Campbell, it is an honor to have you today. Welcome, thank you for being here. Thank you. Yeah, I'm good. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Stoll. And before I start, I do want to make a point and really acknowledge what Dr. Stoll and, and Susan Benegas and Tom Dunham have, have done. They've stepped forward in the last three or four years and really organized some really nice conferences. And so uh, it's really, really nice to work with, with this group. I started this uh, journey 63 years ago this August, professionally. Um, and so I, I've got 63 years worth of data to talk about in the next 63 minutes. It's not going to work quite that way, but in any case, I've gotten to a point in my career when I'm, I'm able to look back and, in a sense and sort of try to get a feel for where we've come from and what we're doing now and where we should go. And, and so I've actually just about finished another book. Hopefully it's going to be coming out in the fall when I'm kind of reminiscing over this sort of thing and seeing what I think is missing. One of the things that I, I would suggest is missing is uh, the, the idea that the way we have actually talked about the science of nutrition, the topic of nutrition, uh, is, uh, is a bit old. And we need to think about it in a different way. We tend to talk, talk about nutrition in terms of individual nutrients doing something by way of some particular mechanism affecting some particular disease, if you will. That's really caused a lot of mischief, a lot of confusion for many, many years. It's actually set back the whole science of nutrition. And thus, it has set back, too, the whole food plant-based uh, movement, if you will, with a larger community. Because with all the confusion that seems to exist in this field in general, to say nothing of the whole food plant-based nutrition itself, uh, is problematic. So I've written a couple of papers in the last couple of years. One of them called Nutrition Renaissance, and uh, that's the title of it. I have it here. I'm not going to be able to get, obviously, to cover that subject fully here, but I kind of want to just lay the groundwork that I've spoken about often that serves as the, if you will, the basis for some of this new kind of thinking. I'm excited about this new way of thinking about it because it's the kind of, uh, kind of information, in a way, that in my view is inarguable. It's inarguable. It's, it's basically a reflection of what nature is and how nature operates with the food that we eat. Uh, and it's far more complicated, infinitely complicated, as far as molecules and atoms and reactions and so forth and so on are concerned. So it becomes a question not of what, what one thing does or doesn't do. It really has to do with, from a scientific perspective, it has to do with standing back and try to get a sense of this vast, enormous amount of information we have to deal with and try to make sense of it. Um, I'm going to share with you quickly, some of you I think probably have heard me speak before and I apologize for I'm going to go over much the same thing in a sense. But just to leave you with just a couple of observations. Not get too deep into the weeds about the details, but try to look at it in sort of a a broader perspective. I've been obviously in the professional field of nutritional biochemistry the most recent years since 1975 at Cornell University. So I'm, I'm in that, if you will, a so-called establishment, if you will, you know, work, work, just actually work, focusing on nutrition. And uh, so I'm actually anxious to tell this story, not just to the public at large, but also to enlist the support of my colleagues in, in the professional field. I came from a point of view that was exactly opposite that which I now espouse. Uh, I was raised on a dairy farm, milking cows, and, uh, and then when I went away to school at Cornell University, I actually then did my doctoral dissertation on the idea that uh, of all the things about nutrition we need to know and pursue was the idea that consuming animal-based protein was the most important. So my doctoral dissertation was exactly that, a little bit technical, but basically it was designed to figure out ways to make more efficient uh, our production of animal protein so we could consume more. Uh, and then shortly thereafter, I was at a, my first faculty position. I was at Virginia Tech, 
where I was assigned the task there, among other things, to be the coordinator for a nationwide program in feeding Maldives children in the Philippines. It was there that uh, I learned something that set me on my career. I learned, for example, that uh, I was wearing two hats. One happened to do with cancer research, the other happened to do with nutrition research. And, but I saw something that was at odds with what I just showed you, that the whole question concerning making animal protein more, more important. What I saw, those children in the Philippines who were consuming the most protein seemed to have a higher risk for liver cancer. Kind of an odd thing. One would have thought it was exactly the opposite. Uh, but I knew that. I knew some work from India at the same time. It came out showing this was experimental animals. In this case, experimental rats that were actually uh, being tested for their ability to form this kind of cancer, liver cancer. And so these researchers thought, you know, we, they wanted to know something about liver cancer because they're pretty prominent in that part of the world. So they thought, like many people would in those days, if they gave these animals more protein, it would be protected maybe against getting the cancer. So that's what they did. Just a quick summary. One group was fed 20% of total energy as protein, the others 5%. One's on a little on the high side, the other's on the low side, but more or less the range that we humans use. Uh, and this was, these were animals that had been exposed to a carcinogen to give rise to the cancer, right? And they're very, very powerful carcinogen. It was the most, and still is today, most powerful carcinogen ever discovered. So they just put them on this diet, 20%, 5%. They said, thought, at least hypothesized, that the animals get more protein, they get protected. So that's the results they got. Not a big study, but they had that. The animals in the higher protein, they all got cancer. And the animals in the 5% did not. Really striking, as I say, I emphasize this is a small study. But nonetheless, because I was wearing two hats, going to the Philippines to try to introduce the consumption of more protein for these children, yet on the other hand, saying this. I mean, obviously, something's wrong here. So that's really what got me started to get involved in doing the basic research on this question. Is this true? I mean, I, did, I tend not to believe it from my own background. So we got money from the National Institutes of Health, the National Cancer Institute in particular, and that one particular grant then lasted for the next 27 years. And I had a lot of students, fellow researchers who got involved with me and so forth. Uh, and I just wanted to know, is there any possibility, this is true, that higher protein actually might increase cancer? So we use this model to understand that. I want to understand, too, something about cancer, because in those days we didn't seem, from my perspective, didn't know a lot. We sort of knew that cancer started with genes, maybe. Uh, maybe the genes had been mutated and so forth. But that was about it. There wasn't much to do with nutrition. It all had to do with environmental carcinogens. Um, so there, again, what, we, what I thought I saw in the children, what was produced here, both cases, more animal protein, more cancer. What I'm showing you here is a little experiment. We just did what the Indian workers had done. Feed, you know, all the animals had been exposed to a carcinogen, but then we fed one group 20% and the other 5% and looked to see what happened in the early part of that cancer, first 12 weeks, for example. So when we fed 20%, the cancer was growing really well, shooting right up there. Fed 5%, nothing. And this, now, both groups had the same exposure to the carcinogen. And keep in mind, carcinogens are those chemicals in our environment that we get so concerned about, environmental chemicals, if you will. A lot of people think we get cancer because of those. It's not really true, but in any case, here we got this really powerful carcinogen, just treating them with protein and saw the spectacular results. Among other things, I wanted to do, see what would happen if we changed the diet back and forth. Feed them 20%, let's say, for the first three weeks. Those early cancers are growing quite well. Feed them 5%, cancer went off. On, off. That was really exciting because there was nothing had been shown in that, or even given a hint that cancer grew in response to nutrition. It was all thought, and too many people today still think, that our cancer comes from chemicals. We'll come back to that a little later on. So we could turn cancer on and off. I couldn't have imagined anything, quite frankly, more exciting than that, being able to turn 
cancer on and off with a very powerful carcinogen just by manipulating protein intake. That was, uh, I'll get ahead of myself a little bit. And I will tell you, that's all animal protein. That's a protein of cow's milk, as many of you probably know. Plant protein did not do that, even when it was fed at 20%. So there's all something very special about protein of animal origin. Specifically, in this case, it had to do with the, the protein of cow's milk. That's why I'd like to show that story. I grew up on a dairy farm milking cows. And I, I just did like everybody else did. We ate a lot of uh, dairy and meat and so forth. So it's kind of hard to recon reconcile that with what my own background was and so forth. Here's another little slant on that story. And that is that uh, if the animals are fed, I mean, if they're exposed to a carcinogen, the cancer doesn't grow if they're feeding 5% protein. And so I thought, well, maybe after, you know, 10, 12 weeks or so, by that time, that carcinogen would have already disappeared from the body. It wasn't around. What would happen if we just gave some protein then? You can see there. Which led to a really pretty exciting idea. And that was, and I can, I'll jump way ahead without all the data and simply tell you that we get cancer, according to this hypothesis here. We tend to get cancer because we've all got some genes that's been changed, been mutated, in one way or another with chemicals here and every place. We've got some genes to give rise to cancer, of all kinds, by the way. Some of us have more of that than others, but that's, that's kind of by the, beside the point. Those genes will lie dormant as seeds do in a, in, a, in a plot of ground. They'll lie dormant, be latent. They won't, you won't be seeing them do anything for much of one's lifetime. It's not until we start putting some fertilizer on them, if you will, in this case, animal protein, they start growing. And when they start growing, you can turn it off again. Gives you a, a sort of suggest something else that's very exciting. Maybe cancer can be treated by something, like, something crazy like just simple nutrition. So out of this simple experiment years ago, and I think this, is, this stuff was going on like 40 years ago in my laboratory, I was getting onto something I felt was really exciting. Understanding something about cancer hadn't been known before, first. And secondly, also noticing something about protein, animal protein. Genes are like seeds. We spread seeds all over the place. You know, the seeds don't grow unless we have some sun and some water and decent temperature. They can just lie there dormant. And then when we put back the water and the sun and fertilize, if you will, they might start to grow. That's what cancer really is. I'll come back to it later. It was very provocative then for me to even say that. Uh, and I was kind of speculating more in those days than I do now. But in any case, that idea has escaped the cancer research community. And I'll come back to tell you what I mean by that. Now, many of you may find it surprising if you're just coming to this field for the first time. We talk and get excited about what nutrition can do to heart disease and cancer and diabetes and so forth and so on. Cancer, uh, we say things like, oh, if you eat meat, if you do animal foods, if you do this and that, we have a higher risk for cancer. But you may not know, the experiment has never been done in a formal, professional way, has never been done to take a bunch of people with cancer and then change their diet, see what happens. Very exciting. It's never been done quite that way with a whole food. It's not one thing, it's a whole plant-based food. Uh, and my youngest son, who co-authored the book with me, The China Study, who was uh, in theater at the time, uh, an actor, he eventually went off to med school. He got very excited about working with me and then eventually he got his medical degree, his residency, and now he's the medical director of a program at a major medical school actually taking up this research. He's got a study underway right now with women with breast cancer, stage four breast cancer. These are women whose cancer has returned. What he's doing is to see if he gives them this kind of diet, what will let happen? They say, you may be surprised that's never been done, but it has not. We tend to do research in this field one thing at a time, which is part of the problem. We don't like look at things more holistically. So we'll see what, what I'm not going to speculate at this point in time. It's a very first step and we'll see what happens. 
But that kind of research needs to go forward. It's a whole new dimension for what nutrition can mean if it works out. Something about this question concerning protein turning on cancer, in those days when I was involved in this, I was think, thinking simply like everyone else, basically. What's the key mechanism that accounts for this protein effect, this alarming protein effect? So in the laboratory, we worked on this particular question for like 15 years. I had a bunch of students who did their doctoral dissertations on this question. I was looking for the mechanism. What I mean by mechanism, which enzyme is it? Which, which event occurs? Is there some event there that can account for this effect of protein? Mind you, by this time, I'm still a little doubtful. And in order to be able to get more confidence in the idea that high animal protein could turn on cancer, we had to look for what is the mechanism. And there's a second reason for doing it that way, those of us who research, and that is if we can find the step in the, in the reaction sequence, if we can find the step that we might block it, maybe with a drug, maybe we can stop cancer. In fact, that's the basic thesis for the entire pharmaceutical industry. So we look for a mechanism. Those are the three stages of cancer development, by the way. Initiation, promotion, and progression. Initiation is the stage where normal cells are being converted to cancer cells. And the second one is when the cells are dividing, 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 and going into a mess. Third stage, that's when we're usually diagnosed with, with a problem. In any case, we look for the mechanism. First stage, initiation. That's the stage where a chemical comes into the body, goes into the cell, and then causes a mutation. That's to start cancer, that's the idea. So that first stage actually is more complicated than that. High protein elevates the enzyme that activates the carcinogen. When you feed more protein, this enzyme that actually activates these carcinogens, the high protein increase that enzyme activity. A couple of different ways, in fact. Uh, and when, when I'm saying, so the chemical comes in, now it's in the cell, Enzyme acts on it, produces a product. That product is very reactive chemically. So reactive that it zaps the DNA, binds to the DNA, for example. DNA is part of our genes. And so when it comes in and hits that gene like that, it corrupts, damages the DNA. And then if the cell divides at that point in time, it passes on to the next generation. In reality, we have mechanisms on a normal state that when that happens, and it's happening all the time, what happens when the DNA is being zapped with a chemical, ready now maybe to do some damage, we got a mechanism called DNA repair that actually can reverse that and correct it. And that's part of this first stage. We look for the mechanism, each one of which, you know, required about three or four years worth of work, somebody doing their doctoral dissertation. Every time we look for the, count, the mechanism that might account for this protein effect, every single one of those mechanisms we tried there got turned on. The high protein diet increased the amount of the carcinogen coming into the cell. It increased the enzyme activity that activates the carcinogen. And it increased the amount that was binding to the DNA. And then this is, this is worse. There's one mechanism there that's, our, that's to our benefit. We have this ability to repair all that kind of damage. It's called DNA repair, as I just mentioned. It turned out the high protein diet actually compromised that activity. In other words, we've got a fail-safe mechanism here. It's working all the time. It's very, very efficient. But the high protein diet corrupts the fail-safe mechanism. That's what happens. So I didn't know at that point in time, which one of these mechanisms is amenable to, let's say, blocking it in some way. We went to the next stage. And the next stage is promotion, and so we looked at a bunch of things there, too. I, won't, I can't go into details. Each one of those are worth a couple of hours of discussion in a, in a scientific sense. But basically, there again, once these cells, cells start growing, they have the same thing, they're there working away, uh, creating mischief, and the cells are dividing, dividing, dividing. At that point in time, the body draws from the immune system. The immune system starts producing some cells called natural killer cells. That's a good name. Uh, those natural killer cells uh, are basically uh, there for, in the body to actually kill these new cancer cells that have just formed. Again, a very efficient process. That's one of the fail-safe mechanisms we have. 
And what the high protein diet did, it, it actually zapped, it compromised that too. And it did a bunch of more things. The high protein diet, all this, I mean, there were 10, in those efforts, there were 10, I could count 12 possibly, different mechanisms we were looking for to account for this, whether this high protein diet really meant anything. And every single one of those things we saw, every single one of those events changed in response to the high protein diet in the same direction. It knocked down two of those events that are there to help us out. All the rest are kind of encouraged the chaos to grow. So at this point in time, I'm saying more essentially, what do I do next? Which one of those mechanisms is amenable to working with it in some way, maybe to make a drug, if you will, that sort of thing? When it finally occurred to me that there is no mechanism. That was a really radical thought, I suggest, for your thinking, because that is, in fact, the question most often asked for those in the drug industry when they want to make a new drug. If they're looking at a, a diseased woman like this, what they'd like to find is the mechanism that accounts for all that, and they're going to hit it with a drug. That's the entire drug industry to a great extent. There is none, which raises some really serious questions about the whole world of thinking about drugs. So there you have it for protein and cancer, and they say the high protein diet causes these cells to form cancer cells, and they start growing real fast, and all that sort of happens, zip, zip, zip right along as long as we're eating high animal protein. Get rid of it, switch off, and experimentally at least, they think it's come back in the other direction. So my point of all this is that there's some lessons here. I saw some very provocative things that got, started to get me in trouble. You know, to talk about you know, the cancer industry not doing things quite right, or questioning that revered protein, a high animal protein, that was kind of deadly in a sense in the cancer community. But there it is. This is serving as background for the book I will be telling about in the next few months. When I get the book done, I'm really anxious to tell the story, you know, what the final part of the story is, because I say it's going to supersede anything we know as far as uh, nutrition and disease is concerned. The second stage here, I just put out, picked out one of them, the natural killer cells. There, there's an initiative that is started at the National Cancer Institute just after Obama had left office. Somebody convinced him, a group of cancer researchers, I'm sure, that they needed another $4.8 billion. They got it. It was appropriated. And it was being kicked off under Joe Biden's name, quite honestly, to a great extent, because of his unfortunate uh, occurrence. So that, that program was kind of taken off and had been taken off since. It was justified in large measure, at least as far as a lot of news reports are concerned, I think a little bit superficially, but it was being justified that this new idea, they called it pre basically precision medicine initiative, sound like nice words, precision are going to get it, medicine initiative. So now they're looking for finding a mechanism. And the one they focused on was natural killer cells. We did that work with natural killer cells 30 years ago. Nobody paid much attention to it. And what we found out was that protein could control that natural killer cell activity better than anything else. So now they're coming along and they want to obviously do the thing I'm suggesting. Find, let's find a drug to see if we can stop that. So take home lesson. Cancer, like many diseases, but especially cancer, it involves infinite numbers of mechanisms it makes no sense that what we tend to do in science, go and just find one thing and say that's going to give us all the answer. It doesn't work that way. In 2002, at this point in time, I'm getting kind of exercised. I want to talk about it. Finally, decided to sit down and write the book at the insistence of my wife. Stop complaining. She said, write it down. Uh, and so my son and I were sitting and working on this. And so some of these very profound kind of observations were coming into, into the forefront. And I was interested to see, does any of this apply to any other diseases besides cancer? Here's a list. This list here is a bunch of different diseases for which there has been evidence in the literature for upwards of 50 to 60 years and ignored. Not in a complete detail, of course. The researchers were working in these areas. They didn't develop fully. But nonetheless, there was evidence. All of that sort of got ignored. 
And when I say ignored, and I'm talking about these diseases, look at the title. The whole food, plant-based diet, in one form or another, prevents, suspends, and or cures all these diseases. So there's a kind of an old story. It's kind of, sort of is an old story, and people didn't hear about it much, but and not nearly as detailed as what I just shared with you, but a lot of diseases here seem to be at play. The whole food plant-based diet is very broad. As they say, it doesn't involve one disease. It's very fast. We know now people who have some problems, disease or otherwise, if they go onto this diet in 10 days, you'll see cholesterol plummet like that. You'll see a lot of things happen. Many of you may know about this. So it's fast, it's broad. And if it's sustained, which it needs to be, this diet thing is not a drug here, now take away later. It's something you have to go to, do it, and stay with it, and don't go back. So it's that kind of thing. It's basically a lifestyle. And one of the exciting things that comes out of this from my perspective of the research that we did was this possibility that the whole food plant-based diet not only prevents future disease we might necess not necessarily worry about, but the really exciting part of this message from my perspective this is a means of treatment. Now we're stepping on some very sensitive territory because that's the purvey of, if you will, the medical institutions. To come in and say, we, okay, we got some patients, that's the first thing we can do. Let's, let's put them on this diet. We already know, now we have a lot of evidence, not enough published yet, but we have a lot of evidence. When we do that, remarkable things happen. So this story has become much larger this is not some fly-by-night idea of you do this and you won't get that in the future, stuff like this. This is uh, the total package. Dr. Esselton, my very good friend, he and I became friends 30 years ago, actually, when he learned about mine and I learned about what he was doing. So I want to just put a comment here uh, about that. He, as you know, got a bunch of uh, heart disease patients together and gave them this sort of diet. He called it something different at the time. He was a physician and he was doing it that way and he got some remarkable results. Dr. Dina Ornish had started his work about that time, a little before actually. Um, and uh, so between Dr. Ornish, who you heard here this morning, Dr. Esselton, and actually another gentleman back in the 1950s who was ignored, to be considered to be a crank, uh, Morrison, Mr. Morrison, they showed that heart disease in this case could be reversed. He had this study that he sort of did. He, after he did the first study you know about, then he came along and retired, same time I did, he was at Cleveland Clinic, I'm at Cornell. And he was still taking patients in and counseling them, and here's the way you do it. These are all heart disease patients. He goes back later and asks him, hey, you still doing that? A certain number did, 89% did, 11% did not. Those who complied with his advice, whole food may base, only one person had a cardiac event in the next two, three to seven years. The others who did not follow the advice, 67% of them went on. So I just want to put that in there just to illustrate you know, how this information, in my view, is kind of coming together. With, certainly, uh, that had a great deal of influence on me, his and, and uh, Dr. Ornish's. Here's something else about this field that has been troublesome. And I've lived it, I've seen it, I've been involved to a great extent at times. And that is when this information started to be first told in 1982, the National Academy of Science report, there was a lot of interest in the idea that foods that gave rise to more beta carotene in our blood, were, that was a good thing because if you have more beta carotene in the blood, for smokers get lung cancer, they got more beta carotene in blood, comes from you know carrots and greens and stuff like that, they got more beta carotene in their blood, smokers had a lower risk of lung cancer. So beta carotene looked like good stuff, right? There was an interest, why don't we take the beta carotene out and put it in a pill, really make it good. A group of Norwegian and American scientists got together to do a study. They did a study on heavy smokers, gave them pills, beta carotene. Another group, no pills. Then they saw what happened after five years or so. It turned out the ones with the, the ones who were getting their beta carotene from the food, sure enough, their cancer, their lung cancer, were down 19%. It's quite nice. But when they looked at the group who were getting their beta carotene from the pills, disease was increased. That caused a furor at the time that was done. That's now been shown for a number of different nutrients when in pill form. At least the general consensus in the field that nutrition does not come from taking nutrients out of food and putting them in pills. In other words, nutrient supplements are not where the game is. Yes, you could see some early effects in pressure of people, but it's not the way to go. 
we're talking about, and this is where the concept comes from, whole food, let everything work together like nature planned it. Not get so caught up in this nutrient done this or that or anything else for that matter. Let me just introduce you to another idea that's not well understood. Namely, I'm going to just schematically trace for you what happens to a nutrient. We consume it and then where it goes to. It goes through, let's say, a number of different stages. They're all interconnected, so I'm kind of arbitrarily dividing them up. We consume the food. Let's say we know exactly how much nutrient is being consumed. It goes through digestion. A certain percent of it is released from the food into the intestine, let's say. The next thing, there's a certain percent that is released in the intestine, then is absorbed. Some of these things go into our bloodstream and they're going to be carried in an inactive form and some of an active form. The active-inactive, that ratio, one to another, that's important to consider. Something's going on there. The nutrient now comes to the cell, door, wants to go in. And so it goes in at a certain rate. That's regulated. And then it gets in inside the cell and then there's all kinds of stuff going on. This reaction, that reaction, everything else. We can know in the beginning, in theory, when in reality, actually, we can know exactly how much nutrient we consume. But that does not tell us that we know how much nutrient is actually acting at the active site. So there's virtually no relationship, for the most part, between the amount we consume and what, what actually functions. That's a really important point. Because what really is going on here, as the nutrient comes through, there's a lot of variation up and down. Maybe a digestion, maybe in one case there's only 10% being digested. Another case it might be 50%. I can make the same argument with each of these steps. And we have individual scientific data to prove this point. A lot of variation. So all you need to do is think. These changes, the rate at which it goes from one step to another, these changes that are occurring are happening within nanoseconds. Nanoseconds. It's a very dynamic system, like that. So we can't tell from our minds, and there's no way we ever will know. We consume this, and we're, at this, we're going to get this much worse functioning. No way. That's a presumption that people have made. We've all made that presumption to some extent that they're kind of related. Not really. What's going on here is that there's something else operating here. Something else is controlling things, you know, under the sun, if you will. Before I go into that point there, Let's say, in theory, we got all the numbers. We knew what went from stage one to stage two to stage three. We knew the rate at which it transported. And that's why we had all our nice numbers. If we did that for one nutrient, now turn around, add another nutrient in there. All that changes. So I just want to add a word of caution in interpreting science that we've assumed for a long time we know more than we think we know. And then what we left out of the equation no matter how much number crunching we do, how much we know of this or that or something else, there's something else operating here. It's been left out of the equation. We're going to say it's nature. It's nature. Body seems to know what it does. Consider all those different steps, and many more, but consider these steps as transistors. You know, dimming the light from step to step. And it's always changing within a nanosecond. And then if you theoretically know what it is for one nutrient, then it's all gone when you add something else. Everything changes. Stop and think what that means. It means why are we so fixated on knowing exactly how much nutrient is being consumed, or how much is in the food for that matter? Or why do we, fix, why do we fixate our, you know, our minds on this mechanism is going to work and not that one? And see how we're getting, or sort of out of sorts here? Now I'll just give you a little picture of a cell. You all know what a cell is, I think. We've got between 10 and trillion, 100 trillion cells in our body. Can you imagine that number? And each cell is like a universe, infinitely complex. You've got the nucleus, you've got mitochondria, you've got this and you've got that, and they're all talking to each other. All this is so dynamic. That's my point, it's so dynamic. And I'll put that back to what I just said. You've got one nutrient coming in there, it's getting manip manipulated all these different ways, in fascinating ways. And of those, uh, each cell, incidentally, is not, it's a cell, it's like every, got all these 10 to 300 million uh, uh, universes, micro-universes. Each cell, not visible, can easily sit on the head of a pin. So you can't see them. Can you imagine that number of cells, that complex? Each of them being so small, we can't even see them. And they're talking to each other, by the way. There's a lot of stuff that's going on that's beyond our control to a great extent. Certainly, we can't define that sort of stuff in terms of numbers. So it, it, it sort of introduces, for me at least, 
a very different concept, a very dynamic system. It's something we've got to acknowledge. Got to, we've got to acknowledge that in terms of the nutrient we're consuming, and we only know just a tiny number of chemicals that we call nutrients. There's a few hundreds of thousands and millions of other chemicals in the food too, especially in plants, that we could give names to, and they're acting like nutrients too. So the whole idea of just calling a nutrient a nutrient a nutrient is not a very good idea, to be honest about it. So everything is working. We're working in this massive different ways. A little more illustration of complexity. This here is a first stage of metabolism. We live as human beings capturing energy from the sun. It's put into some chemical bonds and some molecules. And then we turn around, take those molecules and zip as if we kind of unzip them a little bit, step at a time, taking the energy out of those bonds and put in another chemical. So we capture the sun's energy, come down and then the body chooses how to use that energy, send it here, send it there, whatever. Again, it's all controlled. This is the first series of reactions. I think most of you have heard of the Krebs cycle. How many have heard of the Krebs cycle? Some heads, like Carlos says. This is really fundamental biochemistry. There are these steps coming through. It's just an exercise and capturing energy from the sun. We depend on that, putting it into these molecules, and then we take in the body delivers bits of packets of that energy around to do what we would like to have done. That was one I used to teach biochemistry. As we learned about things, you know, these reactions started to add up. That was when a few years later it became that. I stopped and think. You can't even read that, and that was intentional. Well, you couldn't see it anyhow. But you know, all these reactions all going on, building, building, building. And this is only just a small fraction of the total we now know. So biochemistry involves reactions, chemical reactions, A to B, C. It involves just a, a plethora of reactions, all sort of connected with each other in some way. That's so complex, it's incredible. You get to that point, that's like, that's word, what that word says. What in the world? You know, what are we trying to, why are we fixating on one thing at a time? You know, just trying to make something big out of it. Trying maybe to find a drug that might stop something. It's kind of silly, to be honest about it. I want to show you how this plays out. Here's my chart again, glycolysis and Krebs cycle. Here's an attempt where somebody found a reaction, a specific reaction that seemed to limit what happened at the end of the line. The reaction they were pointing to was a chemical there called acetyl-CoA. You can't see that, but in any case, that was discovered to, begin, to be the beginning stage of forming a really interesting compound that we worried about in those days. Let me tell you what it's going to be. It went through a series of steps, lots of enzymes. One of them was kind of key, so the story went. It was the formation of cholesterol, estrogen, other steroids. So I'm just showing you here from biochemistry to a chemical that's meaningful to us. What we're learning here, what was learned back in the 80s, the chemical comes down like that, and then it starts changing, changing, and changing, and it makes cholesterol. We have to have cholesterol. We have to have cholesterol, and the body decides how much it wants. It's critical. It's, sort of, it's important in our nerve function, for starters. But there was a time, and still today, unfortunately, that cholesterol is a big bad guy. Don't eat cholesterol. It causes heart disease. How many of you heard cholesterol causes heart disease? Oh, look at that, all the hands are up. Part of my book, I'm going to argue, cholesterol does not cause heart disease. Because with this new kind of thinking, it, it, it doesn't. It's not a cause-effect relationship. Anyhow, all these steps. But in those days, in the 80s, somebody came along and found this enzyme. But I said, if I could block this enzyme here, I'll get my cholesterol down. Because cholesterol is supposed to be, you know, a cause of heart disease. So they found the specific reaction, and then they found a chemical to block it. The chemical is kind of neat, right there, schematically. The chemical was called statins. So the birth of statins, it was the beginning of the industry of the statins. Got himself now a statin here, he's going to block that thing. They give it to people, and sure enough, cholesterol go down, more or less. Arguably how much, but it went down somewhat. So, they made an industry out of this. Now the industry's latest count I've heard is about an $80 billion industry. Lots of people taking statins. Because allegedly, the claim is, if they can block the formation of cholesterol, you don't get heart disease. I'm, I'm oversimplifying to some extent, but that's what they probably tend to believe. Statins are not working. 
like a lot of people would have you believe, especially the industry will tell you it does that. Yeah, there's some little that get cholesterol down, but the question is, getting cholesterol down, does that stop our heart disease? The evidence on that is that statins do not, to any significant extent, actually reduce uh, heart disease rates. It makes you feel good. There are some evidence that clearly, according to some of my colleagues, has shown that yeah, it reduces heart disease by, let's say, 9%, 10%. That's the best. But these, these results are around, all around the barn, and I, I haven't had an opportunity to go in to see the distinction between them. So there's some evidence that, yeah, it gets down. Maybe heart disease go down, but, it, but what you get with it is a lot of muscular problems. So here we're making an $80 billion industry trying to find out one reaction, getting one chemical, now there's different variations of statins, get one chemical to block heart disease. Do you see what Esselton did? He was able to do far more. And Dr. Ornish, they were able to do far more than working with, just, just eat the right food. No comparison. For me, it illustrates this, this notion of making things too simple. Here's a similar case for cancer. It's more, more in my territory. Do you know it cost, this is of 2014 figures, it cost between 1.3 and 1.8 billion dollars to make a drug to treat cancer. That's a lot of money. That is a lot of money. Actually, if you calculate, if you add to that the, the opportunity cost, they call it, if the money had been invested elsewhere, it would earn some interest and so forth, it comes up to about two and a half billion. Two and a half billion dollars to make one more cytotoxic agent that has problems or what? Let's we'll see what we know about that. A group of Australian and American scientists gathered together a whole lot of data. And they went back to see how well are these chemotherapy agents working using the same concept. And they studied a total of 22 different cancers and all the chemotherapies that went with it and so forth. And they looked at how much people survived beyond five years. Did five years survival increase for all these drugs? Only by 2.1%. It's all together over the previous, I think it was at the time, about 60 years of using these agents. That comes from the notion, this notion. When people say, as cancer researchers do, cancer is caused by genes. That's all you need, yeah, that's all you need to know, just know the gene. That's what they like to say, and then get tested for it. And so, with that notion, not knowing about nutrition, then, then if it's all caused by genes, those genes, they're mutated genes, they don't go backwards. So the traditional thinking has been for decades, the cancer is a progressive disease. Once started, it keeps on going forward. It doesn't go back. That's what we did in our animal study. We made it go back. But something really simple, but nutritional means. So they still operate on this assumption. Cancer is dangerous, we gotta take care of it. Let's get a drug, let's find something that we'll call them cytotoxic, that means kill cells. So they invented a lot of cytotoxic drugs because you had to kill those cells. That's the only way you could treat cancer. That doesn't make sense. First off, it doesn't, they don't seem to work very well when you look at the data in the aggregate. And secondly, um, they cause side effects you know the side effects of cytotoxic chemotherapy drugs. That's, again, an illustration. Major drug, major problem with this simplistic thinking, just sort of talking about drugs. Incidentally, there's a statement taken off the National Cancer Institute. That's the Institute of NIH. It says cancer is a genetic disease. That is, it's caused by changes to genes that control the way cells function. That's the first thing on our website. They spend you know, a few billion dollars doing the research. Actually, that institute did fund all of, 90% of my research. So it's public money, the other 10% all came from the public in other places. So I've been really very much involved in the National Cancer Institute, both in getting funding, sitting on committees who, did, who determine who else is going to get funding, as well as speaking on policy matters. So I've known the institute from the top to the bottom, actually. And I've lost faith in the way that we work things especially in this area here. They still want to stick with this idea. Hundreds of billions of dollars making these chemicals. Now they've got some new versions, not cytotoxic, but other kinds. Chemicals that maybe block natural killer cells, for example. Anyhow, it comes back to right there. That's why 
that study right there illustrating this concept. If we can't so turn it on and off, why are we then trying to use these chemicals just to kill the cells? Again, it doesn't make sense. I'm coming back to look at a big complex mixture here and saying that's the drug protocol. You know, now we've got 93 or 95 percent of people my age all taking drugs. I don't take any drugs, never have. I did on a couple of cases when I once had a whooping cough in one of the first cases. But uh, other than that, I don't take drugs. My wife, 78 years old, doesn't either. Uh, and we don't need to go down the drug route, but that has actually become the norm in this country. That's the medical system. Go and get you a new drug. You know, collect money, go and do research, you go and do that, and they tell stories after the fact. It does, first of all, it doesn't work in theory. The drug protocol is going in one thing at a time and in complexity. The nutrition protocol, where you, if you get the right food, you get all this stuff working together, it begins to come into that system and works together as, a, as like a symphony. I like the word symphony. Single notes, even a single instrument sometimes, they don't make an orchestra-like sound. Same thing here. I want to think about it in a more holistic way. That's the word I rather like for that purpose. So I'm going to kind of conclude here. Holistic nutrition, I'm going to define it that way. Multiple nutrients, infinite nutrients, let's say. Multiple mechanisms, multiple disease reversal, multiple, all of this kind of working together. All kind of nicely woven together. Somebody's controlling all that. And we don't have anything to do with it, except screw it up. We're just not, we're not into that. And we haven't figured out how to do that. That comes down to the whole food plant based diet. Because it turns out that the best, the best recipe literally is that recipe that has a whole collection of menus made of whole plant based foods. And you get these remarkable effects across the board. And I, I'm calling it a fact of nature. It's a fact of nature. And that's what's got me so excited about it. And when you start thinking about it that way, and then I, this book I'm working on right now went back into the history of this field, back to the 1700s, and I found some really interesting uh, things going on at that time to begin to explain why we got into the wrong track. We, we had an idea then back in the 1800s, and it was closer to what I'm talking about, and we rejected it. Instead, we chose the drug route. Now we have what we have. That's not exactly a pretty story. So I say this holist nutrition is a highly interactive, integrated holist system with a W on it, minus the cult of animal protein. I, don't, I haven't had a got a chance to get into you to tell you the story about animal protein. The argument for the vegetarian vegan diets, for example, has largely been an ethical one, as all of you may know. It's not a scientific one. It's that it really hasn't done a very good job that way. Uh, and, uh, on the one hand, it's a good idea, yes. I, I, I support that, that, that sort of thing. But in the process, that was a reaction against the consumption of animals for good reasons. I didn't get there that way. I get here through what I didn't get you know, a chance to describe to you. An argument why we should never have ever eaten animals. The science, I'm going to say, is in there now. I'm anxious to come out of the book to show what I believe is almost irrefutable evidence to show from a scientific perspective, from a historical perspective, why did we get, ever get on this track of believing in animal protein? Most people think protein is animal protein. Why did we get on that track and believe in that animal protein was the centerpiece of our diet and caused us so many problems? Hundreds of millions of lives lost that could have been saved, billions. We took the wrong path. And so I want to come back and make the argument. From a scientific perspective, obviously it gets into political, economic, social, cultural. I mean, all those issues come into play. So my take on all of this, eat whole foods, yes. Simple, eat whole foods. Just don't eat any that has animal protein in it. That's the big deal. And then, as far as attractiveness is concerned, take all these foods, make them the way you like, and there's infinite varieties of recipes. Use the spices and herbs to keep the ethnic cuisines that we like, and keep them attractive and tasty. And you got, I think, a fantastic solution to the problem. 
Medicine has been a reduction. I call it reductionism versus holism. Medicine is a one disease, one cause, one mechanism, so forth. The opposite of reductionism. So medicine is reductionist in nature. As I already emphasized enough, enough one, one, one kind of thing. Nutrition is holist. The one that wins the day as far as health, holist produces health. Medicine does not do that very well at all. This is the China study that many of you may know. I just got uh, informed here recently. It's been now translated into 48 languages, uh, which I'm told is a record. For, uh... <laughs> I've spoken, quite frankly, all around the world on this subject now, and I'm finding that we're all people. <laughs> we're all people. We have different whatever. Uh, and we tend to think of ourselves too exclusively at times. Uh, but uh, there is something common for all of us. It's the same story. The same story. You know, abusing food to get our health. And the process is really important. In the process, now we know eating the right food helps us more than any other single thing to bring the climate, the environmental question under control. That is a really big issue. And I haven't had a chance to talk about that, but our climate changes now are said to be with evidence primarily the responsibility of eating the wrong food. So think about it. Eat the right food. It actually becomes enjoyable. It may take a little while to get to it. But eat the right food, you get health. Who doesn't want health for a long time? In the process, the health care cost bill can be dropped, I'm sure, by 80%. At the same time, we deal with the environmental problem. So this is a really big story. The food we put in our mouths really has such an enormous implication for us as individuals, for our neighbors and friends, other societies, all world alike. And so what all that leads to is something I find very exciting. That was written up to some extent in the book Whole. Holist nutrition involves countless nutrients, mechanisms, and health outcomes, and they're all favorable from plants, that is. Holist metabolism within the cell is infinitely complex and changing when within nanosections of time. Holist nutrition is a constitutional thing. I don't want to be presumptuous, but I'm going to suggest what I'm talking about is the biological theory of relativity. That's what it is. As it exists in the physical world, I'm saying now we're on the cusp of really trying to understand what the devil that means. And it has so much to offer. And I've seen it myself from working at the policy level as well as in the laboratory, and we're all caught up in it, whichever level we're operating at. It's really kind of fascinating. I want to tell you about an online course we have. Uh, I don't, I have to say this because it sounds like I'm promoting something. I get no money. I've never taken a cent from this operation. We've had a very successful venture in this area. You have an online course uh, in conjunction with Cornell University. Uh, some of our folks are here. It, we're really trying to emphasize that the, uh, that the information we're offering in this course is science-based. We get continuing education credits for doctors and other people. Got a, quite a group, crew of uh, faculty. It's all 100% online. There's the information. And it turns out of the 400 or 300 or whatever it is I haven't heard lately, courses at Cornell University, um, we're number one out of the 300 or 400. So this idea... <laughs> I, th I think we have come of age you know, to, talk, to talk about now with real evidence, I would call it irrefutable evidence, to show that the ideal diet is a whole food, plant-based diet, period. We've got to get on to it. We've got to figure out how then we can take that information and tell the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, and I, this, I think this is where the world starts. You folks, thank you very much.